Welcome to another 1v1 here on Soccer Down Here. Thanks for hanging out with us today. I'm Jason Longshore, and I'm joined by somebody whose life has gotten very, very busy since last time we talked. Tony Annan, interim manager of Atlanta United 2, academy director for Atlanta United. Tony, you're wearing a lot of hats right now. I am. I am. And I'm obviously practicing my one-on-ones with you because I'm on here quite a bit, so <laughs> I'm getting better. You might be our, our most booked guest at this point. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> um, how crazy has, has everything been? Just getting into the the flow of things in the USL Championship over these last couple of weeks. Uh, it's been it has yeah. The word is crazy. Um, obviously, the when Frank's parted ways, then the everything just kind of went into a tailspin. We were just sort of getting the academy back ready to come back to training, getting everything ready for the protocols for that, which are pretty stringent with the MLS. Um, it's not like we can just roll out and train. So going through weeks of prep for that and all of a sudden having to switch gears and going back into full-time, and I mean full-time coaching, um, obviously it's a professional team, so it's uh, it's a lot of hours, it's a lot of work, but at the end of the day I'm managing to do both at the moment and we feel like it's going fairly well, but yeah, crazy times. I want to come back to the academy stuff because it's all you know in flux and, and interesting as to where things are going to go there with the new program. But let's talk USL. I think one thing that probably was a, a source of comfort for you is you've coached a lot of these players before. Yeah. Um, obviously, I know a lot of them because they came through the academy, which is obviously our pipeline. And it's getting good guys into the, into the USL system as part of our ethos. So... You know, running into these guys again full time, it's been it's been a lot of fun. But even players like Mojidama, who I had when he was 15 at Norcross, kind of shows my age. But it also uh, it's nice to to be reconnected with him. You know, so a lot of the squad is it's familiar to me. Even Jack Gurr, who I didn't coach, but obviously I knew Jack. He's from Newcastle. He was at college in Atlanta, and I helped him get in the club for trials. So. I've got quite a few connections to the guys in the team, which is always a bonus. You're not coming in fresh, you know, with no no relationships. That's key, especially when you're coming in, you know, on an interim basis and, and hitting the ground running with a lot of games in a short period of time with this crowded USL schedule at the moment. You've had a little bit of everything in your matches so far. You've got all kinds of different results, all kinds of things that have happened. Just being back on the touchline again, how's that felt for you? been great been really good obviously it's the highest level I've coached at so far um, but I'm really I'm really liking it I'm enjoying it a lot I've got Matt Lowry who's assistant who's fantastic he's everything an assistant coach should be and more uh, which makes things a lot easier um, but yeah being back on the sideline obviously reacting making changes the buzz of game day the, the thrill of the of a tight game stuff like that is you just can't buy those emotions um, and it's been really, really good. Obviously, I'm really happy with the way that the team have been playing um, and obviously showing our principles as a club. So it's uh, it's, it's really good. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Am I crazy when I say that the match in Birmingham was the strongest performance of the season? Um, not crazy. I don't think you're crazy for saying that. In many ways, it was our strongest performance against a very good team, that have invested a lot of resources and money into a, a very experienced lineup, um, and we're also having our young bucks, you know, rolling them out and them play. I I think playing Birmingham off the park at times during the game, um, and the stats pretty much showed that. Um, I, I think it was a really good showing from our guys, and I think we were very very unfortunate not to walk away with a tie or a win. You mentioned the the principles, and this is something that I think has become evident and more evident every match that we've seen starting last year with Stephen Glass, this season starting with Stephen, and then now with you. Can you define those for people who, I think, try to figure out what the Atlanta United style is, and they go to formation, and they go to playing vertically, and they go to pressing? You know, What are some of the principles that you're looking for in a, in a performance like Saturday in Birmingham? Yeah, I mean, look, formations are just their starting positions of a pitch, right? It's not 
I wouldn't say a principle of ours is a formation, but we do like to play a 4-3-3 because our principles come out of 4-3-3 most prominently in that lineup. So, but you know, we are a high pressing team. That's part of our culture. It's part of our ID. We like to press. We like to win the ball high up the field. But we also like to, in possession, play expansive and play through the lines and play entertaining football. I mean, the build, as you can see, obviously with Stephen and Henry, it was already in place. We've accentuated that because we tweaked the formation a little bit to really accentuate our build. And I think all the games we've played so far, we've tried to build and play exciting, entertaining soccer more than any team we've played. And we've we've outpassed them and we've outstrung passes. Our pass count is obviously way higher than most that we've played. So when we talk about principles, it's it's sticking to the ID and sticking to the, identi- the identity of the club, which is let's win the ball high, let's press, let's be aggressive in our actions, let's be on the front foot and let's, let's take the game and control the game. That's part of our identity is we want to control games. And I don't mean always controlling with possession. Sometimes you control it without possession, but we want to control. We want to take control of games. We want to high press and we want to build and play exciting soccer. That's pretty much, without diving into individual principles, that's the ethos of this club and that's what we are trying to do with the teams. Is that something that's become easier now that you're you know, multiple years into the academy and you've got players who are stepping into a, a USL match for the first time but have three, four years of experience playing under those principles? Absolutely. I mean, you take a look at any of them. Take a look at Will Riley. Take a look at uh, Caleb Wiley. Take a look at Gano, uh, Coleman Gannon. You take a look at all these players, and they've all got similar traits in the build and in the press. They understand what's required because they've been getting it in the academy day after day. Um, and not always with success either. So it's, it's easy to see that they've been entrenched in this culture of what identity is until they get to this team and then hopefully it comes out in there a lot easier than it would if they hadn't you know so now you're seeing these academy players come through and and display those traits and and show that how has it been for you to reconnect with guys like jack or with mojadama who haven't been in that kind of system until now how are they picking it up and how's that been for you kind of explaining and teaching yeah, again, I mean, it's, 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 the, it's the best part of it, right? It's taking a guy who didn't come through your system and say, look, this is who we are and this is what we are and you have to believe in it. It's, it's not just, it's not good enough to understand it. It's not good enough to just understand the principles. You've got to believe in it and you've got to actually perform within that. You know, it's, and someone like a Jack who's high energy, loves to get forward. I mean, to be honest, when you're picking players based on their profile, Jack's, the profile of the club. He's an attacking fullback who loves to get forward, who, who's very dangerous with the ball in the final third. But he's also a very good defender and he's got massive energy and he gets up and down. And if you think about our first team, that's Franco, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the profile of our first team players. With Mo, obviously he's been around a little bit. He went to Chile, he was, in, he was at the Timbers, he's, he's bounced around. So he's seen a lot of different things. But again, relationships are very important in coaching and having a player believe in what you're saying and believe in what you're doing is 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 pertinent. And I think my belief that the last few games that we've played, the guys have bought in and they're seeing, you know what, we can compete with these guys. It doesn't matter that he's on a lot more money than me or he's a veteran or we can compete and we can almost nick games off people and actually be better than they are. So that's part of it. I mean, the relationships is part of it, but also the proof in the pudding of, look, this works for us and it's who we are and we're very difficult to play against. And to be fair, to respectful of other teams, they've actually said, you gave us all we could handle. You know, And that, those are big compliments for a young group. Absolutely. And, and this is one of the youngest groups in the USL Championship. You know, we always go back and forth in terms of development and, and, and when is too young when is it time to get a player minutes when is it time to kind of ease them in how hard is that decision for you when you see guys that come to the academy that you believe in what are the things you're looking for when they get to that point and it's time for the usl opportunity what do they have to show you to get that playing time what do they have to show you to be ready 
Yeah, I mean, listen, different people have different opinions on that. Um, you know, you talk to some fathers in the club who think their 15-year-old is good enough to play in games in the USL. And Caleb Wiley is one of them, you know. So it's a, it's very difficult to forecast who will make it, who won't. Um, there are certain traits in the players that do make it that we've seen year after year, which gives us an indication of we can push them or we can do this. Uh, we can put them in this situation, they're going to handle it. But you never know. I mean, you're never sure of what is too young, what is too old. But basically, if if they're smart enough with the ball, if they've played at a level where they have been challenged and they have passed the test, and then they've been challenged again and they've passed the test, then you sort of look at them and you go, OK, now it's time for the next challenge. The problem in, the, in this day and age is everybody wants to be at the letter Z, but nobody wants to do the letters between. And I don't just mean players, I mean coaches and everything. But if we're talking about players, there's a process to getting to the USL. Playing up, being challenged, playing against all the players and rising to that challenge and being better than them. Now you start to say, OK, what's next for this player? What's next for this player? But if you skip the process, you can put somebody let's say there's another 15 or 16 year old and you put them in and they could actually crumble and they could be damaged for months and you might not get them back. So it's important that you go through the process, you challenge them at the certain times. There's also a character piece, right? The entitlement piece. Yeah, we have a big thing here and it's called earn it. And we stress that you must earn your opportunities. They're not given to you because nothing is life is just given to you. So earning your opportunities when you get them, um, taking those opportunities and making the best of that. So, for instance, we had a couple of 16, 17-year-olds in with USL for a while, and we moved them back to the academy when the academy started because we felt they weren't ready for ML uh, USL. Now, I'm looking at them now and looking at their reaction and their training method and their attitude in, with the 19s, and I'm looking for it. And I'm like, right, okay, he's bounced back. He's come back. He's gone back in there and he's working his butt off. So now, do we give him another chance, right? Now, there's one kid gone back in there and he's got a sulk. He's turned up late for training. He's not really into it. And, and you're looking at him going, you'll never make it because we've knocked you down a peg and you've not gotten back up yet. So there's all kinds of little things, not just ability. Ability is the easy one, right? Ability is... Yes, he's good enough at this level. Can he do it at the next level? That's the easy one. But it's, can he mentally handle it? Can he mentally handle getting in here at 7.30 every day and putting in a shift every single day? And then going and taking care of himself off the field. Some players can't handle that change. It's too much of a change. You know, and you've got to dive right into the character piece. You've got to dive into, are they willing to earn things? That's my opinion. I don't think anybody should be accelerated through the academy unless their hands head and shoulders above everybody else and there are very few of them and to be honest in the past we've maybe made mistakes by accelerating some players through without putting them through the process so it's important that to me that they earn it they go through a process and all the pieces of the puzzle are looked at before you thrust them into the limelight and I think as a nation, America is so desperate for players to be successful. The slightest um, notion of excellence is just it's accelerated too fast. And we've lost a lot of players due to that. And I'm sure if you went back through the history of players that have signed young and all that, you'll, you'll see. But that's a long-winded answer. Um, but it's something that I'm really passionate about as far as making them go through a process and earning their right to be there because when they arrive, they're way better prepared than they ever would have been. It's massive. I mean, they're walking into a locker room that has, you know, you mentioned Mo Jadam. I mean, he's played overseas. He's played in big clubs. And oh. you've got to go in and be able to stand next to him and put forth the same effort and be at that level. That's a challenge for a teenager at times. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I hate to bang on about Caleb Wiley, but he, he takes everything in his stride. 
he's just so laid back and so easy going and his parents are so supportive and they don't get involved and they're not overzealous about it and they're very balanced and level headed that that's a good recipe for someone to do well you know his dad never comes to me and says oh what do you think he's like do you think he's ready for the first team do you think he's no, he's just, hey, whatever you think's best for Caleb, just do it, you know. And Caleb's, like I said, he's so confident on the ball now, but that's part of his whole attitude of, hey, I'm here, I'm earning it, and I understand. He drove back from Birmingham, we got back at one in the morning, and what did Caleb do? He switched on the game and he watched the game back. <laughs> you know, those are guys, that's stuff you can't teach and you can't buy. But those are the kind of things that will get people where they want to be. Yeah, and and Caleb's had a, just a, a great run here in in the team, and and seemingly you know gets better every game. Part of yeah. that has been his you know process of development, and, and you mentioned the process, and it starts with the academy. One of the things that's making your life crazy right now is you are the academy director, and the academy's in a different spot with the you know the DA gone and MLS creating a new platform. You know how are you feeling about everything that's coming together on the MLS side, and I know it's got to be rougher than it normally would be because of the pandemic making everything more challenging yeah i mean look the games program in the u.s is probably the most questioned thing that's out there um it's a topic of mass discussion obviously covid has blown that to bits Mm -hmm. so i think trying to get the academy a schedule that's competitive trying to get them a game a regular game a rhythm of game um, is probably the most important thing to us. But we're also sensitive to the fact that this thing's real and it's out there and, you know, we have to be very, very cautious about what we do and when we do it. So I've asked the parents and the players to be flexible, to be patient. And the whole country's gone through it. It's not just us. You know, and some clubs around the country are just doing it with such abandonment that they, you know, they, they may end up getting through this, luckily, or... They may end up the other way, which it, it could be a big problem. But the MLS are trying to put a schedule together, which is regional, so there's not a lot of travel, not a lot of overstay, uh, overnight stays. And I think we've got a few nice things we're trying to develop, which we could be rolling out here soon for the community that will involve the academy with teams in their community and get more games sort of local, because we think that's probably the best way to go now until at least 2021. But yeah, it's, it's a busy time and so much up in the air that you can't really make definite plans. I mean, the, one of the biggest things for us now is our academy's training, but we can't move kids between training cohorts or up to the USL and back down, right? right. So we're kind of limited to what we can do um, until, that, until, we, until it gets better situation. But I would pull probably two or three more guys with the USL, but I can't do it. Because if I do, they have to stay with USL. And if they're not playing games with USL, you know, games are where it's at. And if these 40, yeah, 15, 16, 17 year olds are not going to play in USL games because they're not ready, why, you know, why take that game opportunity away from them with the academy? So it's very really challenging. It's challenging because it's not how we usually run things. It's challenging because we want to do different things, but we can't. Um, but we're just going to have to be patient like the rest of the world. What are some of the things uh, as, you know, everything's coming together on the MLS side with the new platform. What were some of the things that, through your experiences with the DA, that you're looking to see MLS do differently? Um, I mean, I was quite a, quite a fan of the DA, to be honest. I thought the DA did a very good thing at its time. It was, it was needed and it, and it really helped put some structure to the country and the standards along with double pass, obviously making the standards better in youth football. Um, but they, they were rigid. There were some really rigid things that were limiting. Um, but I would like to see the freedom for players to play in any, you know, you had to have a certain amount of players rostered full time and they weren't allowed to play in other teams and this and the other. I think, the MLS has an opportunity to be a little bit more flexible with the games program. Um, I think upholding the standards would be something I'd really want them to do, but the flexibility with the games program, I think, um, is one thing I'm looking for. And look, the, the whole thing is, well, people will abuse that and people will abuse it and play players 
on the same day for two different teams and this and the other. And I'm well aware that could happen. But for the guys who are in it for the right reasons and doing it the right way, I think the flexibility of having players be able to move roster free would be a real benefit for development, if nothing else. You know, so there's a few different things I think the MLS are going to get right um, and make this platform a little bit more attractive as far as the flexibility standpoint and more development centric where I think the DA was more organisation centric. I just think uh, the MLS have got a bit more of an idea of what's needed. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, you know, U.S. soccer trying to do the DA, you, you have to meet the different, I guess, requirements that the clubs have, what the different clubs are looking for. Everybody's got kind of a different idea of what they're trying to get out of this. With MLS, you're trying to produce players. And maybe one of the most surprising things for me has been how many outside clubs that MLS has invited to the party. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's great that it's been inclusive, and I don't think it's, you know, I think at some point they're going to have to get exclusive with certain age groups from a development standpoint. Like, you know, the U17 level, there's no point in me traveling to Boca Raton to win 9-10-0, if that's what would happen. Uh, when I can travel the same distance to Philly and probably get the best game of the year, you know. These are the things that I think they're going to have to work out for MLS clubs who spend a great deal of money um, investing in competition and development where an elite youth club, you know, they, they, they are revenue-based, but they don't spend the money we're spending. So at some point, there's got to be a little separation of the tiers of who's doing what. But I think being inclusive and having everybody have a, have a say and everybody being involved with each other and the opportunity to play each other. I'm not saying I don't want to play those teams, because I do. Those games are good. I don't think our games programme should be all difficult games or all easy games. I think there should be a mixture of games. But the, flex, uh, the tiering of it needs to happen at some point in the future where at least at one age group where development's pivotal we need a more challenging games program. Something else that just broke today before uh, we started recording this, the foundation announced the partnership with, with MARTA and soccer in the streets and the city to open the fourth station soccer pitch. You know, that's a, a different element from the academy side, but just the growth in the community, whether it's station soccer, whether it's, you know, clubs, new clubs, more kids playing than I think we, we've ever seen before. How excited are you to see what might come in the next decade for the city of Atlanta and youth soccer? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I think, look, whatever we can do, pitches, programs, obviously the elite youth platforms, the youth, youth clubs in Atlanta are getting bigger and better and more organized and their numbers are growing. I mean, it's it all benefits. It's a win-win for everybody. Right, Atlanta United gets to obviously hopefully find more players, more talent. The elite youth clubs grow and make their club better. You know, even like soccer in the streets and the station soccer. I mean, that's just opportunities for people to play soccer. And at the end of the day, that's what us soccer guys, that's all we want is the world to be consumed by the sport, right? It's not, we don't want to be number three or number four. We want to be number one. And we want everyone to play soccer. So the more things and more opportunities that come up that we can help with and we can get involved in, we're happy to. You know, that's that's the exciting part about it. But, yeah, I think Atlanta in 10 years will be – I don't think we're not uh, – I, I, I would say we're not, we're not there yet, but I think we could be one of the leaders in the sport. I mean, we're close. You know, our first team is probably the team in North America, in my opinion, of course. Um, but as a soccer hub underneath, I think, you know, Dallas and California are still quite a little ways ahead. But I think we're right there and thereabouts. And the way Atlanta's growing and the diversity of the city, um, I think, you know, five, ten years, we could be right up there with everybody else and doing even better than we're doing now. And that all takes some time, and it's been, you know, just a handful of years. It feels like a long time. It's not when you look back at it, which is the crazy thing. It was a long time to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, a little bit. It's been a lot of hours, a lot of work, and, and you've put in a ton of it. I mean, you've been there as long as almost anybody. Let's take it back to tomorrow now. 
Tampa Bay Rowdies come to town, and you talked about Birmingham being a veteran-laden team that has put a lot of resources to winning games. Tampa Bay maybe is even more in that realm. You know, how much of a challenge is this going to be for the twos? That's a huge challenge. They're a good team. Um, like I said, they've got a. I'm sure their salaries are way higher than our guys. Um, they're all pros. They're all very good pros. They're a good team. They play very good. Um, we have a game plan. Obviously, we're going to try and, you know, win. We're at home. We're not a team, again, going back to the principles of play. We're not a team that's going to sit back in and park the bus to try and get a result. That's not part of who we are. And to be honest, it's not part of development either. But such a young team that still need to be developed, that are still learning. You know, I think we're going to go for it and we're going to give them as much as they can handle. And hopefully we can uh, get three points. I'm excited to see it. It's been a lot of fun calling these games. Um, I'm really happy for you to get this opportunity uh-huh. and, and showing really well and and building this this team up and this program up. And I'm excited to see all of those next steps on the academy side that you've been so ingrained with from day one. Tony, thanks for the time. Appreciate it as always. And uh, we'll be talking soon. No, thank you. As always, it was a pleasure.